Anyways, we're in our sermon series where we begin looking at core value number two, which is God through Jesus Christ has given us complete and total victory over sin. Everybody say complete and total. Complete and total total victory over sin. If I can, I want to take us back to our purpose statement. Why we exist as a church. We're continually tweaking these in the hopes of next Sunday night having a final statement for you. But uh, I've got a lot of inputs and I've appreciated the input I've been able to get. But this has morphed into our purpose statement. Forging in fire the links needed to anchor generations to the biblical God. Forging in fire the links needed to anchor generations to the biblical God. If you'd like to kind of dive deeper into that, look at the message three weeks ago. That'll explain that in depth. Uh, This week, I got a little more input with regard to the vision statement. And it was recommended we look away at at some of the things to kind of make it uh, more powerful and uh, something that communicates better. So we tweaked it a little bit to have it develop into meaningful investment, inspiring powerful life change in our community. Meaningful investment, inspiring powerful life change in our community. Last week, we talked about our first core value as the core value of the biblical worldview. It says we believe the biblical worldview will put people on proper footing to know God and to make him known. The biblical worldview. Today, we're going to go into the second core value. This is one that I'm probably the excited about the most because this is the one that frames everything. It's the idea of what is the victory of the cross. Our second core value basically says that the cross, or we believe that the cross compels us to pursue a life of holiness. And that holiness is evidence, evidence, mind you, of the victory over all sin and the testimony of deeper relationship with God. Our texts this morning are Romans 6.22, Galatians 5.1, and Hebrews 2.14. Now, as we look into this, I want to begin by defining holiness as the result of consecration. Has anyone ever heard the term consecration before? So consecration is this term that basically is uh, indicative of something being set aside to God. It is used or set apart to God. Forgive me. It is a word that is used often for the purpose of worship. Um, Basically saying these things, this place, this body has been set apart to God. So this thing, this place, this body, which has been set apart to God, if it is touched by something common, it is then considered defiled. Hold on to that for a little bit as we make the parallel. Christians are consecrated by the blood of Jesus on the cross. It is what sets us aside to God. So the blood of Jesus consecrates us. The blood of Jesus sets us apart to God. When a Christian is used for God's purpose, they are holy. When a Christian cheapens their purpose, when they fall to the things they previously were used for, they are defiled. Thus, they cannot walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for them on the cross. As I said, I have a couple texts to show you today. The first is Romans chapter 6, 22 and 23. We'll read it out of the NIV and we'll also read it from the message paraphrase. So here we go. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves unto God, The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The message paraphrases it this way. But now that you've found you don't have to listen to sin telling you what to do, and have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise! A whole, healed, put together life right now with more and more life on the way. 
Work hard for sin your whole life and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our master. So let's take away just one thought from this text this morning, this idea of being set free from sin. Ask me, what does it mean? What does it mean? Good question. I'll get you guys engaged here before too long. All right. So let's begin this idea of being set free from sin by defining sin this way, that it is my attempt to handle the circumstances of my life apart from God. We have a God who has created us for the benefit of relationship and has said to us, I don't want you to live compartmentalized in your life. I want to be God of every part of your life, and I want to be God in every part of your life. Hello? So with this in mind, he wants it all and he wants to be in it all. Thus, when we attempt to go our own way, to find satisfaction apart from God, here's what we're saying. God, I don't want you here. I don't want you here. I got this. God, you can have this part over here, but, but, but this is mine. I don't want you to be a part of it. You know the phrase that you've heard time and again, actions speak louder than words. So when we say to God, God, we don't want you to be a part of this particular place in our lives. We're not saying it with our words. We're not that dumb that we would look up at heaven and go, God, no, but our actions do what? They speak louder than our words. I want to remind you this morning that God has a perfect plan for every need in your life. Amen. All right. We're going to get it. We're going to get this going. All right. So if God has a perfect plan for every need in your life, it further emphasizes what we taught last week as our first core value. This idea that we need to learn the biblical worldview. See, if we learn what the Bible says and gain the biblical worldview for the needs that we have in our life, we will learn God's plan for that need. So learn the Bible, learn God's plan for the need, learn God's plan for the need. You're then you're then compelled or nudged or pushed by the Holy Spirit to do it God's way. If you do it God's way, what do you get? God's reward. So. Then the contrast would be, if we don't do it God's way, we receive a different reward for our actions. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the way, excuse me, in the end, it leads to death. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we have a choice. We learn God's plan. We, we, we apply God's plan. We get God's reward or we do it our way. We think selfishly and we get the selfish reward, which clearly is pointing out here is death. God will give you what you have asked him for. Come on now. He will give you what you have asked him for. So he will give you the consequence of you by your actions saying to God, I don't want you here. He will let you have what you wanted. And as Hebrews eleven twenty five 25 says, you may find pleasure in sin for a season, but the pain, the wounds and the remorse for your actions are coming. But folks, this is one of the primary reasons that Jesus died. So that the pain and the remorse and the wounds for your actions can be healed. As we're talking about pain this morning, I want to talk about probably the greatest pain we will ever receive or witness. And incidentally, it's the same pain that God receives oftentimes by our choices. It's the pain of rejection. You see, with this in mind, Adam and Eve, they chose to listen to the serpent. They did so believing the serpent had a better resolution for their issue than God. They listened to the serpent 
And the result was apocalyptic. Man, who was never intended to die, would now die physically because they listened to the serpent. Furthermore, Newton's second law of thermodynamics, for any of you out here who are science geeks, the idea being that everything is in order and it's descending into chaos, that didn't occur until sin. So sin enters this world, man dies physically, all of creation dies as a result, descending from order into chaos, but then we also die spiritually as well. In short, the ramifications of sin, they're so great, they're so bad, that none of us would think that there was a possibility for it to be fixed, that the virus of sin was so aggressive that it would never be stopped. And perhaps we might have argued had we been in heaven at the time, God, why don't you just throw it away and start all over again? But God is love. Say that with me. God is love. God saw you and I and decided to give love perfectly. He was willing to sacrifice Jesus, not just his physical body, but also the fellowship that he had with Jesus. Remember, Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, sin, Jesus became sin and God could not abide sin. So God had to turn his head away. That was probably an incredible moment for God. Amen. But if I could go further. He's willing to sacrifice Jesus, not just his body, but at the fellowship that the virus of sin in mankind can be eradicated. You see, if you think about it this way, Jesus' death was the vaccine. Hold on to that for a moment. Jesus' death was the vaccine. Through Christ's death and resurrection, all of creation is offered the vaccine, and by taking it can see willful sin eradicated from their life forever. We call that eradication holiness. Holiness is a direct result of the cross and, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in us. See, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking that the Holy Spirit kind of parallels the local health department. Think about this for a minute. Major props to Darla. <laughs> All right. It kind of parallels the local health department this way. Follow me on this. They call attention to the virus. They provide education and plans to implement to help us not succumb to the virus. They help us help other people. They are the means through which the virus is ultimately conquered. Am I right? Yeah? Let's continue. Then the same is true of the Holy Spirit. He calls awareness or attention to the virus of sin in our lives. He allows us or leads us to the vaccine of Jesus Christ. He shows us how to avoid the virus beyond that point, leading us to a more spiritually healthy life. He helps us help others, but his involvement is even greater than this. You see... Let me summarize it this way before we move on to the next text. The Holy Spirit shows us what is from God and what is from the flesh. He empowers us to choose God's way and to see the ways of the flesh, what is apparent in us, die. As the flesh dies, the viral load of sin becomes more and more limited as the vaccine works through our spirit and, help us, and helps us develop anti-self antibodies. Anti-self antibodies. That'll get your wheels spinning for a moment. So in short, the cross saves us not just from the consequence of hell. This is where people mess up all the time. Well, I'm not going to hell, hallelujah, but I'll live my life any way I want. Wrong! The cross saves you from hell to live victoriously now. Live free from sin now in preparation for complete release in heaven. So with this, being free from sin means you don't have to fall 
to sin's patterns in your choices anymore. There is no sin that God wants to remain in you and I. Let's look at the next text. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Galatians 5, 1 and 2. The message paraphrases it this way. It says, Christ has set us free to live a free life. Now take your stand. Never again let anyone put the harness of slavery on you. Well, let's draw a thought from this, and it's the idea I have underlined in the text. Stand firm. So here's what we know so far. What we know is that we are free, set free from the consequence of sin regarding eternity. We do not go to hell. Period. But secondly, we are also free of the need to sin while we're on this earth. Now, if we acknowledge that we're free, this should be an easy decision, right? We should be able each and every day to say, onward, Christian soldiers, and just walk the right path, right? We should be, right? Right? No. Why? Because we're human beings. And because we are constantly, until he takes us homeward, we are constantly creatures of the flesh. That is not an excuse. That is an explanation. Because as we just talked about a moment ago, as the flesh dies, we are becoming more like Christ. So as an explanation, we are creatures of the flesh. But as an excuse, we're called the flesh for the flesh to die. Now, keep that in mind. It should be easy, I guess, if we were perfect and totally strong, but it's not. Why not? Because of unbelief, which is not believing, or disbelief, which is essentially believing something else. So either way, the reaction of someone who knows better, or either way, I should say it this way, is the reaction of someone who knows better, but who keeps falling. They keep falling to the enemy's lies, usually because A, in that moment when they are tempted to sin, they will think to themselves, well, this won't affect anybody else. This is just something that is going to affect me. And they further don't understand how deep the effect goes. Or B, they just don't know any better, which is unbelief. Ladies and gentlemen, we will never be successful as Christians until we learn the application of the word to stand our ground. Amen? Amen. We have to learn the application. And how we learn that application is, is really go to the verse that really speaks so boldly about it, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 talks about the full armor of God. And it talks about when you don the full armor of God, once you are thoroughly equipped with each piece of that armor, stand your ground. See, it really speaks to the idea of wearing the full armor, not as a suggestion, but as a requirement. Hence, you can't stand your ground if you don't have the armor on. Armor is only as effective as the person who knows how to use it. This is, again, why we go to the first core value, the biblical worldview. We've got to know our word. But secondly, we need to know how to apply it, because if we don't, the consequence is that very thing we've been set free from is the very thing that we are going to chain ourselves to again. Because you know who will put the chains back on you? It won't be someone else. It'll be you. It'll be you because you believe for that moment that this is the better solution than what God has offered you. So... If we do not address it, if we do not seek sin's end in our lives, if we tolerate it, believing that we're stronger until we're not, and we fall back into the same patterns that we were doing before, this time we're going to carry guilt and shame of knowing better, but doing it anyways, which is where many times we as Christians will find ourselves. You see, we get a little sloppy in our, in our, in our day-to-day Christian life. We quit asking God to set us free. We develop a lazy attitude towards his word or towards prayer. 
And then you know what ends up happening? Those little things that used to draw you in, that used to bait you into these patterns of sin, they come up and then boom, they're there. And then in that moment you go, I could just do this once. I could get away with this. I'll just ask God to forgive me, right? And meanwhile, God's up in heaven going, right? You don't realize what you're sacrificing when you don't stand your ground. So he says, stand firm then. If we stand firm, we, I'll take it. Let me, let me, let me do this differently. If we don't stand firm, we crush our fellowship with God. It may not render us unsaved or, or having lost our salvation, but we cannot live in the victory that Jesus purchased for us by the cross. Let's move on to the final text. Make every effort to be at peace with everyone and to be holy for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It says in the message, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise you won't get so much as a glimpse of God. So we're talking about without holiness. The Strong's Concordance, they say something very interesting, and I found this fascinating. I never really thought this through. It defines holiness as the effect of consecration. Consecration, as I said earlier, is a word that's used to denote a place uh, or things that are set aside to God, things that are used for religious expression, i.e., this pulpit can be consecrated. This communion table can be consecrated. This Bible can be consecrated. We have set it aside, set it apart for the purpose of God. So keep this in mind. We consecrate a building as a church. We consecrate various implements of worship. We consecrate the bread and the cup each time we take it. And in that consecration, we are declaring these things to be holy. Now keep this in mind because why are you here? What is the purpose of man? I've always liked the shorter Westminster Catechism that says the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. If you keep this idea in mind, if we're going to glorify God, what is the essence of glorifying God but worship? What is worship but a daily decision to elevate God in my, in my actions? When I do that, it draws God close to me. But let's go further. First Peter chapter 2, 4 and 5 says, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by man, but chosen of God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What in the world are we saying here? I want to reaffirm to you again that when you got saved, you were consecrated, you were set apart to God. With this in mind, you don't live the way you used to. Not because God is sitting up there with a 40 pound Schofield Bible ready to give it to you for every sin that you've committed, but you don't live the way you used to because now your purpose is different. Yes. You're holy, set apart to God. Ladies and gentlemen, God has consecrated you to be the spiritual house intended for worship. He put his Holy Spirit in you and he intends that the actions of your life bring him glory through worship. So the more you say yes to God and no to self, the holier you become. The holier you become, the more you're able to walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for you by the cross. The more you walk in that victory, the more confident you become to greater things that God has in store for you. Thus, the more you see God. It's a daily choice. Paul said it this way. He said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly among you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once lived when you were living in them. 
But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. Am I getting through? You see, I think the church is weakest when we compartmentalize our lives. When we think Sundays are the only day we're to be consecrated. I think it's time for every soldier of God to stand up and recognize that we are not in a spiritual battle simply on Sundays. We are in a spiritual battle daily. And daily we must make choices to improve our skills for that war. We call the byproduct of that self-denial holiness. With holiness, we can live in the victory Jesus purchased for us by the cross. But it all begins with following, following the pattern of Jesus, the pattern of selflessness, taking up the cross, as was his example, which brings us back to our core value. I want you to examine this core value through the eyes of selflessness this morning. Note the underline, first, Jesus died on the cross. That was the ultimate act of selflessness. His selfless act is our motivation to pay forward what he has done. We pay it forward in others, but we also pay it to ourselves. One way we pay it forward is by living out consecration. My mother used to sing a song, Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. I lift up my hands to your name. And while it's an older chorus, the, the, thought, the thought is timeless. We as believers are consecrated for worship consecrated things become defiled when we allow what we are as consecrated to be used for the unholy, to be used for the common. When we do that, we can't live in selflessness. We live in selfishness. We satisfy the flesh and we cannot be what God intends us to be. People could say, well, Aaron, aren't you just going to tell us all the rules now? Look, I got to stress this. This is not about rules, but reward. Follow me on this. We should not choose to, to avoid the flesh or not to live in a flesh because of an overwhelming fear of hell. Hell is real. It is what it is. It's the place where people out of relationship with Jesus Christ will spend eternity. That's a fact. Amen. But that fear of hell should not be what drives us. What should drive us should be love and a deepening love for Christ and a desire not to hinder the holiness he has for us but to grow in it. So as we practice that consecration with the help of the Holy Spirit, our story is lived out by both words, which are powerful, but actions, which are more powerful. If our actions speak louder than words, they should speak volumes to the world around us, a world that asks the question of why. They might ask you, why do you face what you face without being shackled in fear? Why do you make financial decisions to live beneath your means and to give money away? Why are your kids so level-headed when mine are just tumultuous and crazy? What makes you so different than me? And then you'll get a chance to speak. And when you speak, you're speaking. The answer will be the fragrance of Christ Jesus. Your answer will point people towards Jesus, towards the God that you serve, not because you have argued them into submission and beat them down with your theology, but instead because you've demonstrated real Christianity and focused their attention on the higher power, which is Jesus Christ. This is going to be way small, but I want to bring this message to a close. Pastor Bill used to quote a line from an old hymn, and I actually found all of the lines of the hymn because I believe it's important to read this today 
And I believe it's critical that you do something with this message today. Not to leave here and be like, wow, that was a good message and go home, put on the football game and forget about it. Which is an easy temptation. Unless you like Sunday afternoon nap, then you go home, take your nap and forget about it. Um, This is more along the line of when you have been presented with silver and gold, you have your choice to walk away from it or you have your choice to put it in your pocket. What will you do with this message today? I'm going to challenge you with this by reading this old hymn that Pastor Bill used to quote. Jesus is standing there in Pilate's hall, friendless forsaken. He's been betrayed by all. Suddenly comes the fateful call. What will you do with Jesus? Now Jesus stands alone on trial, ready to face the crowd, to walk his destined mile. In your heart, you're hearing all the while. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Will you deny him like Peter has done? Will you reject him? He's the living son. What will you say when the question comes? What will you do with Jesus? Of course, one final time as we close. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. For one day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me?